Hey everyone, it is your girl Robin and um, I just wanted to kind of do a little message before um, you listen to this episode. Um, This episode means a lot to me because it it really touched my heart and, um, you know, I went throughout the rest of my day really feeling my heart hurting and just feeling tears in my eyes. And, you know, um, before I ended the day, I just you know, sat down and was just asking God, like, what is this? What is this that I'm feeling? And his response was, you're feeling the pain that I feel. You're feeling my heart. And so I invite you to enter into this episode with a open mind and perhaps even honesty and lastly how can you make a change how can you be different and for my Spotify listeners um, you know before we dive into this episode I'm gonna play a song and I would love for you to listen to it. Um, I had this song on repeat in the nighttime while I just processed everything that I was feeling and it really spoke to me and it really helped me um, digest and let go. And so I invite you to listen I invite you to reflect and I invite you to be honest. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Talk where we simply keep things real. (laughs) My name is Robin and today I actually have something really special for you all. We have a guest speaker. (laughs) Yes, we have a guest speaker today. But before I introduce Chris, I actually have a question for all of my listeners out there. How are you doing? Because it's been a minute. It's been a minute, y'all, since we've come together and have had a conversation. So I'm just checking in and wanting to know how you're doing. And yeah, so we have a guest speaker today, Chris Katiti, who I'm really excited for you guys to learn a little bit more about him. Crazy story. I actually virtually met him on TikTok Um, a couple of months ago. I saw one of his lives and decided to give him a follow. And most recently, he posted a video on TikTok that really just touched my heart. Um really caused me to to reflect and um think about what that must have been like um for him so i decided to reach out to him and see if he would be interested in having a conversation with me and he said yes so welcome chris thank you so much for joining and just a little bit about Chris, everyone. Um, he is a human rights activist and advocate for the transgender community with over six years of experience advocating for LGBTIQ plus refugees and newcomers, along with gender diverse communities. He is the founder of Raricon Now, which is based in Edmonton, Alberta. And it's a nonprofit that supports LGBTIQ plus refugees and newcomers. And so before, before I get Chris to share a little bit about himself, I just have three quick questions for you, Chris. Are you ready? I am ready. 
Okay, so the first question is because I see it in your bio that you are an artist and a songwriter. So my question for you is, what's currently your summer anthem? What is your go-to song for the summer? Yeah, I love Afrobeats, but I also like it depends, okay. it depends on the mood. So I might be in mood of, you know, uh, slow music or or you know uh reggae so okay. i hate those vibes depending on the mood i'm in i love reggae and afrobeats too so i'm definitely vibing to that this summer actually not even just this summer but throughout the whole year <laughs> and okay so my second question for you is what is your biggest pet peeve so what is one thing that really annoys you <laughs> Working in my house with outdoor shoes like that gets yes. me off. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I hate that too. Sometimes I'll have friends from like different cultures come over, and they wear their shoes, and I'm like, "Do you know where your shoes have been?" You but... know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Alrighty. And then my last question for you is: If you could go. Anywhere in the world, where would you go? Like, you mean like, you know, just traveling, vacation also? Yeah. Or, or to stay, like to live? Yeah, just to like travel for a vacation. Okay. Um, you know, I've on my list, I have Maldives, so okay. I'll go to Maldives. Yeah. Okay. And why would you choose there? Um, the, I love the serenity. I love water, and um, yeah, there is. I think something about Maldives that I haven't seen. I've been to Zanzibar. I've been to Dubai, but I, I yeah, I haven't been to Maldives. Also, um, Ghana. So okay. I mean, yeah, those are on top of my list. And anywhere special in Ghana that you'd like to go? Um, yeah, I want to visit the shrines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, where like they kept the slaves and all that. I want to yeah. kind of go and uh, visit that ancestral, um, you know, knowledge, okay. tap into that experience and kind of see it. Yeah, that would be really nice. Um, I think the day that I become a millionaire, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm definitely going to Ghana because I just heard a lot of really nice stuff about it. All right, so tell me a little bit more about Raika now. What is Raika now to you? What does that organization mean to you? Um, well, that organization to me is like um you know a family that mm -hmm. uh, i never had mm -hmm. so like a, a space a hub for everybody to be who they are like they don't have to wear a mask mm -hmm. they don't have to be somebody else um they can be who they are and i've witnessed that uh, happened so many times yeah and and how long did you start how long ago did you start Raika now um this was in 2017 so I came in Canada in 2016 for the swimming competitions but I was unable to go back home for fear of uh, persecution by the Uganda police and authorities and by then my family had literally disowned me so I help with um, they disown me because of my gender identity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so, but I I had help along the way. Like the queer community came through for me. Community in Edmonton came through for me. Like held me. You know, mm -hmm. uh, offered a roof, fed me. 
um, and showed me around. So in the process, I, despite me coming to Canada for like the swimming competitions, mm -hmm. international gay and lesbian swimming competitions, I still had to prove to the court uh, that I was trans enough or queer enough to mm -hmm. be protected in Canada. So um, I literally faced, you know, so many um, barriers and there were so many gaps in the system. And I was like, what can I do to, you know, address this gap so that when newcomers come here, they really don't have to go through the struggles and the challenges that I went through. Now, yeah. despite me having the support and the help from the people, from the community, I was struggling and I was dying mentally. Yeah, yeah. I was dying mentally. And uh, there were no support. Like after telling your story or going through that more traumatic experience, mm -hmm. uh, there is no support to support you, perhaps after the court. And you have to face this, you know, so that you can get protection. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I did start by creating awareness. That was, uh, we uh, screened a, a documentary called A Long Road to Peace, where I had half a dozen of two LGBTQ refugees share their stories and experiences. And we screened that. And then I told the community that from this, we are going to start like an organization that will cover up the gaps that yeah. we have seen in the system. Yeah. And, and kind of uh, a space for our people by themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, so I just want to unpack um, a little bit of what you just spoke about because you said a lot of important things. And um, recently I did an episode of what is currently happening in Uganda. And for our listeners out there, if you haven't had a chance to listen to that podcast episode, I encourage you to do so. And um, so, Chris, I'm just wondering if you mind sharing a little bit um, how like how was that like for you? Um, because I think a lot of the times we we hear things through the news and we kind of just depersonalize it. So I would just like to hear from you, um, like, what was your experience like with the Uganda government and kind of what are some things you are hoping will change? Talking about this really like <laughs> like mom, I, I I I literally have my eyes watering right now mm -hmm. um, because Uganda is my home is where I grew up is where like um, I made friends is where um, uh, my story began and is my motherland mm -hmm. but. Um, I can't be there because of who I choose to love or who I choose to be. And I can tell you uh, uh, when it comes with authorities, it was challenging. It was very challenging. Like you can't be yourself. Um, but uh, for my story, uh, there is a way I guess creator <laughs> wrote it. Mm -hmm. that I am a very outgoing human being. So I made so many friends. I have friends uh, that I talk to like now and then. Um, I kind of was still, you know, I played soccer on the national team in Uganda. I've oh. been on the swimming team. Um, so I've been very active. I was very active in Uganda when it comes to sports and, you know, the discipline that comes with sports and the friends that come with sports, mm -hmm. uh, it is for a lifetime. Um, but uh, I did when I, when I was outed, I, you know, lost many of them. Many of them were telling me, go back to God. God doesn't mm -hmm. want that. He is evil. Um, I had my only sister call me evil, call mm. me I don't belong, wanting me dead. So um, these are some, I guess, experiences I can say. But Uganda is a very beautiful country. It's just uh, people are still um, uh, branded by the colonial, you know, rules and what they made because the laws that are going on mm -hmm. where you know left by by colonizers and also right now they are fueled by religious you know leaders yes. religious you know um 
of faithful people, which I find it challenging sometimes. I'm like, um, how can a religious leader, someone uh, who, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, age themselves to be godly and loving and caring, wanting someone else dead and alive because of who they are, it still doesn't click. It doesn't land. Yeah, it, it doesn't click with me, me either. And I truly think a lot of people don't realize how much of an impact colonialism has had um, on our culture and even within the black community. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's such like a conversation that needs to happen and needs to be dissected um, because for myself, like I'm just here and I have goosebumps because it just reminded me of times where, because I grew up in a Christian faith and there are aspects of Christianity that I value more specifically how Jesus loved and loves. And there have just been times where I have decided to do things against the norm and how quickly people are ready to say that you're demonic or you have black uh, backslidden. And I just couldn't understand like how a religion that is founded and based on love is somehow spewing so much hate towards individuals today. And for myself, it was heartbreaking to see um, what is going on in you. Uganda, um, I think what really shocked me was that like the government um, was wanting and is wanting to unalive people for their sexuality. And I just said to myself, like, this is nothing but pure evilness and nothing more. Yeah, that's that's literally so true. I mean, like they have already started doing this. They've already started raiding and um uh, the community is really in, in fear right mm -hmm. so like as i talk with so many trans friends and uh community back home but mainly the trans community um um it is scary because they're the face of the entire community yeah um yeah and um i think the world need to know that this is not only an issue uh, for Uganda LGBT community, but it's an issue for the entire world, you know, yes. whether you're queer, whether you're not, you know, um, it's, you should be doing something. They should be saying something because they say uh, when um, uh, someone is facing, you know, injustices and because it is not happening to you and you think, okay, after them it's you next in line it doesn't matter whether you are queer or gay or, or, or straight mm -hmm. uh, something bad is bad an injustice an injustice and exactly yeah and so i know you were talking a little bit about the barriers that you face when um you arrived in canada and i will i want to hear a little bit more about that because for example here in nova scotia where i am i think there is this preconception or maybe it's just across the nation um there's this preconception that newcomers come or refugees come they enter into canada and all is well a lot of people don't realize the amount of barriers within the system and how that can be how that even how that can even be hard if you're doing it by yourself and still reliving some of the trauma so yeah, um, I would love to hear a little bit more about the barriers that you faced when you arrived in Canada. Yeah, um, I think before I hit that, I want to, you know, um, perhaps the listeners know, share this, that uh, refugees and newcomers come to Canada because they see it as a safe haven, mm -hmm. you know, so they're not prepared for the, you know, discrimination, hatred that they might face. It's a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. And we have to face it. We have to take it. So coming from that uh, kind of awareness, um, some of the barriers that I, I, I first one was, you know, uh, first of all, language barrier, that uh, being able to communicate, despite me having, you know, you know, education from the university, I still had to, you know, like, 
ask people to slow down so that mm. I can get what they are saying. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the, next, the next thing was housing, you know, and that was a challenge because I slept on people hosted me. Like, I, I was grateful that I had people who could open their doors for me, like host me for a week and then I had to move and then go somewhere else someone hosts you for a month and then you have to move someone hosts you for a week then you have mm -hmm. to move like in the process of course i lost so many things and you know you lose yourself as well in the process um the other thing was you know mental health like people wanted to tap into like my story my experiences and by the time um there was no uh, support for me right all I wanted is to you know to be okay and there was no training for me when it came to media I swear to creator that the, the year that I stayed here like I spoke to every media I guess in mm -hmm. Canada you know but then like the heat from that when it came to my mental health it was really deep yeah. I wasn't prepared for that. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, I wasn't ready for the transphobia and homophobia, mm -hmm. but um, it is so much alive in the queer community, the, yes. especially the transphobia. Yes. And uh, people don't talk about it or look away. Um, and it is challenging the other thing was racism racism i didn't know i was black until i was in canada mm -hmm. you know and i make sure i say this because i didn't know until canada put me in that box of you are black and this is how we treat black people so i had to learn the hard way I was kicked away from, uh, you know, from, from my place of work because I spoke up. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it, yeah, um, when it comes to, you know, the refugee and staff people work, you have to sit down, you have to write your story, you have to look for supporting documents. Most of the time, supporting documents are back home in Uganda, right? Yes, and sometimes yeah. it is hard for you to access those documents, right? Or you have to pay to access those documents now imagine you have nothing but you know mm -hmm, <laughs> you have to mm -hmm. your support documents so that you can get and, and doesn't guarantee that you're going to be accepted you know so yeah. it's like the 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 jargons of collecting these supporting documents of putting your life out there of many people have lived in closet like for example, in Uganda, like if, if, if you're queer, like some people have been in closet, right? Mm -hmm. You can come out and live freely like people are here. People are having pride events. We are seeing the prime minister on these pride events, members yeah. of parliament. It's different in Uganda. It's never like that. So mm -hmm. people come here and, um, you know, uh, still cross the day. They're still scared. I'm like, how are people going to see me? What if, what if, you know, something like that happened again? But then they are actually asked, I, I was going to say forced, because it, it relates to mm -hmm. share who they are so that they can get protection. Mm. You go, wow. I'm saying. Yes. Wow. So, so you, if you've been closeted for your entire life, you're not even ready to come out, but if you want Canada to protect you, you have to come out to them. So mm. that for me is, you know, uh, 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 challenges the mental health of different individuals, right? Because at the end of the day, they have to be by themselves and they have to heal and navigate the, the entire process of how that went or of how that impacted them. Yeah. And also, um, you know, lawyers, sometimes legal aid will say, no, not take your case, you know, so you have to find a lawyer. Some of them just write whatever they have without no help of anybody. Mm -hmm. And yeah, their refugee claims end up, you know, being denied. Um, some of we've supported people who are facing deportation because yeah. perhaps interpreters in the immigration were homophobic, transphobic. Yeah. 
and um yeah like i uh, to mention but a few but even like the other challenge i would say the most biggest challenge that i did address was community like yeah. Yeah, like, because it gets really lonely when you're in a place where you're new, you don't know people, and it's a new experience. You're just starting your life brand new. Like, I left everything. I left my friends. Mm -hmm. I left my family. I left my things. I mean, my brother burnt most of my things. But I left all that, you know, at Mm -hmm. 21 years to start a life without knowing anybody you know uh without people who i i i used to play with i used to have fun with I, yeah. but starting by yourself so i just want viewers to visualize that you know yeah. as a refugee like you have nothing you you've had everything you've had a house you've had a home you had food you had everything but one day you have Nothing. Nothing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you see, this is what a lot of people don't hear or see. And there's there's this word you use to describe Canada um, as safe haven. And I see it a lot in my work here with newcomers in Nova Scotia, where they are really expecting Canada to be this amazing place of safety, which... Yeah, there are some aspects of safety here, but when the reality of Canada and the culture here, especially if you are black, hits, it can definitely take a toll on one's mental health. And even when it comes to navigating different services and whatnot. So I think it's really beautiful that Rari Canal kind of creates that community because it can get lonely, especially during the winters. Yeah, yeah, it does really, really get lonely. And so do you have any community events in Edmonton? Like, I guess I'm just kind of interested in how you are creating community in Edmonton right now. Um, yeah, like I've come to, you know, before I really share that, I've come community how powerful that is and how healing it is, mm-hmm. you know, because um, I've been able, I've been telling my friends, like I'm one person who gets up and I'm going to Toronto and I don't have to pay for a hotel. I don't have to pay for nothing. My people are going to host me. They're going to feed me. So that's community. I recently went to Dubai and that was community. Like I was fed. You get what I'm saying? I was taken Mm -hmm. care of. Like, Mm -hmm. like I, like that's so special to me. Like Zanzibar is the same thing that happened. Like I have community there. I've been taken care of. Mm -hmm. Where, where other people have to pay. You get what I'm saying? My community, yeah. you know, I can choose to, okay, I'm going to Vancouver. I, I'll have people who host me, who take care of me, who will feed me, who will say, you know what? We have canceled everything for you. Like, this is what my yeah. brothers have done for me. Like, uh, okay, you're coming? Yes. Okay, we've canceled everything. No more plans. Come. You get what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah. Time. So like there is there is that wealth and richness when it comes to community that I really uh like um I'm testing it. I guess I'm living in it, the abundance of it, and it's so fulfilling. Um um anyway, the question you asked like um uh, about like community and radical now, right? Mm-hmm. It's um uh, I've witnessed so much that I wish the world can get an opportunity to see, to witness. Yeah. Like the joy, you know, the abundance, the, the love folks have for each other, despite them coming from different culture background. Um, like you, we see each other. Mm-hmm. Like, very intentional it's it's interesting because throughout my life i've heard this saying of chosen family Mm. and what you're describing here about community and how you travel to these places and people are willing to host you and provide for you it 
it almost sounds like a family Mm -hmm. and it's just interesting how sometimes in life you know we lose everything but then we gain so much more like if you think back to maybe when you were 15 or 12 did you ever think you would have so much community around the world Mm -mm. i wouldn't but like um it's I don't know. I don't, I feel like many people don't really experience it. And on the other hand, I feel like if to experience something, you have to create it, yeah. you know, and uh, some one, one time someone told me you might not experience this from the people you have supported, uh, but you will experience it from the world. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm literally swimming in it right now. But swimming anyway. in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but hold on, are you still swimming at all? Yeah. What? Yeah, I I swim, but like not on a competitive team or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but I go there and swim for me. I can get a two k in. I can get a one k in, depending on how I am, how I feel. But yeah. Wow. I, I recently learned how to swim in January and yeah. I, I can just make it to the middle of the pool and then I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Swimming is just a lot of work. It is. It takes practice, but you yeah. know, it's such a very like uh, um, health sport. I always tell people uh, soccer made me, but swimming saved my life. Mm. I always tell mm-hmm. people that. Swimming saved my life. I like that. Um, I just have one more, I guess, kind of question for you, um, talking about the transphobia within the queer community, because I feel like when we see the 2SLGBTIQ+, and plus, and plus, and plus, there is, I guess, this perception of unity, and the reality is that within all communities, there's often um, times of, like, some division, and so... What is some of the transphobia you are noticing within the LGBTQ community and what would you like to see change? Um, some transphobia that I'm seeing in the community is, you know, exclusion of trans people mm. uh, in all queer activities. Mm. So they, and I'm, I'm, I started with that because it's like something I'm finding a solution for. Mm-hmm. And uh, specifically, uh, you go to different pride events, you go to pride organizing events, or even like LGBTQ organizations themselves, and you find that they're making decisions for the trans people, but then on their board, there is no trans person, mm-hmm. on their team, they, in their whole, whole organization, they've never hired a black trans person, you know, for all these times, for all the years of of existing, and then they still claim to be providing supports and help for the trans community. So I start from right there, the power. We, people think um, the, they have power over trans communities, that they, they have taken mm-hmm. that away. Like the power dynamics that are playing in the LGBT community where uh, when they see a trans person kind of joyous and prospering and making things happen, uh, it, it, it changes them. I think the, the, the LGBT community also think trans people are supposed to be uh, mentally ill mm-hmm. or, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. they, as not supposed to prosper or they are supposed to be speaking for us, especially the gay white men. Yes. They, yeah, like taking up spaces, even spaces of trans people. You get what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. um, actually what I do in that is creating spaces for trans people, specifically black trans people to have a voice. Mm-hmm. And this is uh, this has been, I've been called racist, but I'm like, wow. call me a racist. I'm cool with that. 
as long as I'm creating spaces for my people, I, as long as I'm taking what belongs to my mm. people and giving it back to them, you can call me whatever you want to call me. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so, so that being said, um, we have actually different events coming up in, uh, in November. November Trans Dove Remembrance. We have a very massive event coming up that I themed Antidote of Oppression. Okay that we have uh you know different black trans leaders you know uh around the world going to show up here in edmonton here in wow. canada yeah and like some are going to perform i'm going to you know uh launch my album i'm also going to screen a movie i just did and Unpack unpacking black trans legacy mm -hmm. that was funded by story hive and it is going to be um uh streaming um, on Terra Optic TV. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this this month, please keep an eye out. Even on, on Terra's uh, YouTube, it's also Story High YouTube. It's also going to be streaming and, the, you know, some wisdom in this mm -hmm. documentary and uh, awareness. Anyway, the other transphobia I wanted to say that, you know, we are facing in the community um is always being um the labeling and from the lgbt community and also um uh, the internalized biases i'm saying internalized biases but there should be another word for this mm -hmm. um it's just internalized biases what came on that people have internalized what the world has told trans people are Right, mm -hmm, so in the, mm -hmm. so they are not immune to these internalized biases, internalized hatred, internalized discrimination. Uh, when it comes, internalized trans misogyny. When it comes to the the trans community, even our friends, even our neighbors look at us as like, why the hell are you taking those shots? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, yeah. you're not okay, right? And like the way they talk to us is different. You, you get what I'm saying? They mm -hmm. can't hold sacred or intentional spaces for us, for the trans community, which I find, like, especially in the LGBT community, like, the trans people should be at the forefront. Their yeah. needs should be put at the forefront. Yeah. But it's different. People have internalized what the, when the world say, oh, yeah, trans or affirm, affirmative, you know, gender care or affirmative health care. Yeah. Um, uh, they're like, oh, yeah, what is that? You know, no, no, no. I don't want my child, you know, youth, shouldn't. And, and, and the entire LGBT community, most of them, they have the same ideologies because yeah. they've internalized. They have weird this kind of, you know, discrimination and then they project it on us. Mm -hmm. So that and uh, the other thing is resources, literally denying the community resources. Mm -hmm. If I, I always say this and I've said it again, hormones should be free for the trans community. We should, we should not pay for hormones. You know, we should not pay to be who we are. If a cis man is not paying for their hormones, if a cis woman is not paying for their hormones, why is it that the trans community, we have to go and pay for our hormones? Like, what? Wait, wait one second, because this is new to me. So they're charging for hormones if you are queer, but if you are cis, you don't have to pay a fee? You don't have to. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, as a trans person, like, I can't tell you how much I've spent on just purchasing wow. homes, right? And syringes, like, yeah. Wow. So, that, <sighs> yeah. Discrimination. <laughs> like, you can't be any more clearer than that. So alive in the community, in the community. So, um, yeah. So really like so many things, uh, but m mostly uh, the mental health, like how I've, I've, I've been like challenged how the world view mental health. Yes. You know, for me, I feel like our mental health, like people saying like, no, 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 no. 
why we are struggling with mental health is because we have to pay for our hormones. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We have to learn to be by ourselves. You get what I'm saying? We have to hide so many things from the world so that we don't get bullied or yeah. you get what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. and these are some things that perhaps we shouldn't. We should be talking about this, but you have to carry all this suitcase on your head. The world has not allowed you to put it down to land and yeah. open it. You get what I'm saying? They want you to carry it by yourself so that, you know, you are named, you are bullied, you are flamed to be something else, but they have not created spaces or a, a home for you to land that suitcase, open it up and tell mm -hmm. the world your experience. Yeah. You know but they want to tap into your joy. Yes. You know yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Wow. 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 Sorry. I'm just still in shock about the hormones. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm still in shock. <laughs> okay. So I heard you mention the film Unpacking Black Trans Legacy. Is that the correct name? Yes. Okay. And that's going to be streaming where? Uh, on the places called uh, Metro, oh, it's called Metro Cinema. Okay. Granio Theater in Alberta. That is on November twentieth. But this month, actually, mm -hmm. it is uh, streaming on Story Hive YouTube and Terrace Optic TV. Terrace Optic TV. Okay. Yeah, channel nine. And um, when is your album coming out? I want to hear a little bit more about this. <laughs> <laughs> my album is actually out. Oh, know? yeah, and like for my album, this this is what I told my brother. I'm like, my brother, this album was for me. I'm mm. telling my story. I'm telling my experience. How I feel. The past seven years I've been in Canada, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, moving forward, um, my music should be is is supposed to be empowering and motivating, yeah. right, and uplifting. But this album was I was telling um, a story of how I came here and where I'm at and the experience in Canada. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I am a hundred percent sure so many people will read it to it so what's the album's name it's called same blood and where can people listen to it uh it's on spotify it's on apple music it's on youtube it's everywhere on all streaming platforms okay. same blood katiti katiti is k-a-t-i-i-t-i -I -I. that's my artist's name okay um, you guys hear that? I hope you guys are listening. Please go and check out Chris's album and also check out Unpacking Trans Legacy, which is streaming right now. And then also, Chris, um, just before you go, um, and also for people that may live in Alberta, can you share a little bit more about the event that's going to be coming up in November where there's going to be trans leaders speaking, um, actually trans leaders from around the world that will be speaking? Yes, yeah, so this uh, event is going to be in November 20th on Trans Day of Remembrance. Um, we'll be hosting uh, different Black trans leaders around the world. And uh, the theme is called Antidote of Oppression. So the, the main, the underlining uh, issue with this is healing, is community, is joy, and also giving the world um, that it is the trans community that will, that has the power, sacredness, to be the antidote of the oppression. Because we have moved through uh, this world, you know, and we are shining, we are making things happen. This world, despite the world deeming us unworthy of life, we yeah. are still shining. We have swum through oppression and we are still here. We are still living. We are still creating spaces for our people. We are still healing the world. We are still creating opportunities for so many others. So, and 
that is the antidote of oppression yes. that yes whether there is oppression or not we are here we are prospering we are joyous we are living in abundance so yeah and also like we'll have like they they will perform the different artists who perform that day um uh they are you know um uh music that will go on will have a cocktail mm-hmm. it'll be really like yeah like just visualize a very sacred healing powerful space everyone will be washed with that joy and you yeah. know <laughs> yeah so. <laughs> oh my gosh well that sounds amazing and you know what i'm glad that it's happening in alberta mm. because i feel like that's a good space for it to occur because a lot of these things usually only happen in Toronto and it's like, yeah, Toronto is not all of Canada. <laughs> no. Alrighty, Chris, thank you so much for just sharing today. Um, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you. I, I still have goosebumps to be honest. I'm just sitting here and I just still feel teary eyed just listening to you speak and just the amount of stuff that you're doing in the community. Mm. And it's just interesting how, you know, kind of even before all of this, people wanted to unalive you and were burning your things and all that. And yet you bring so much joy to this world and to other people's lives. And you have so much purpose, like, you are doing so many amazing things and I don't know I'm just I'm just at loss for words and I think this is amazing and again I'm just so thankful that you said yes to having a conversation with me and I really hope that everyone that listens to this even people who are listening with their own ideologies um, about the trans community I really hope that perhaps you guys have learned something today um and i'm chris if listeners are wanting to connect with you on social media where can they find you and what are your account names yes so my instagram uh has a black trans at the bio and that's also my uh, twitter um my um, music is Katiti Music on Facebook and also um, uh, Instagram. And then uh, Prince uh, Katiti, Black Trans at the Bio on TikTok as well. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'll put that down in the description below for anyone interested in connecting and learning more about Chris. Please go ahead and give him a follow. Also, make sure to listen to his album, which is out everywhere, including Spotify and Apple Music. And lastly, if you are in Alberta, please, please support and check out on November 20th, the event that is occurring on Trans Day of Remembrance, which is about the antidote of oppression. Thank you again, Chris. You're most welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Real Talk, where we simply keep things real. Again, my name is Robin. And if you haven't already, go ahead and give us a follow over on YouTube. And um, also check out our new Instagram page, Real Talk Podcast with Robin. You can find it underneath that handle. And uh, yeah, that's about it for me. I'm about to close out with the one, the only Katiti, Chris's um, song title, Thanks. So yeah, if you're a Spotify listener, check out for that next. And if you're not, um, I just, I don't understand why you have not made the switch to Spotify. But anyways, this is not an ad. Um, this is just me vibing. I love my music. And when you follow me over on Spotify, you can listen to all of that greatness. So anyways, here is Chris or Katiti himself with his track called Thanks. I hope you guys love it. And we'll talk soon. Ciao for now. <laughs>